Okay, so we're very happy to have Chuang Chao visiting us from uh, the Institute today, and he's going to talk about beyond symmetry, topical lines, topological lines, and TV. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to talk about this project I did uh, in the past couple of months with uh, Chiming Chang, Ying Xuan Ling, Yifan Wang, and Xi Ying uh, on topological lines in two dimensions. Uh, and let me start with the motivation part. Let's see. Uh, yeah, all right, let's start. Okay. So the title has start with beyond symmetry. So maybe let me start with the ordinary symmetry case. So as we know, global symmetries are usually very useful in containing renormalization group flows. We can first talk about the ordinary global symmetry. <coughs> the more uh, recent fancy jargon, by ordinary global symmetry, I mean the zero form global symmetry. So if you are not so sure about what the zero form means, it uh, doesn't really matter here. So the global symmetry is either discrete or continuous are always useful. Constraining RG flows. Especially when they are anomalous. Uh, more recently, there are all kinds of study on the higher form global symmetry. They are also proven useful in constraining RG flows. But today, um, I think uh, the, the, the project we did uh, uh, last month, what we put out last month, was more in the orthogonal direction. We don't want to explore the higher form global symmetry, but rather we want to talk about some uh, some topological operators. They can be thought of as generalization of the ordinary global symmetry. I'll be more precise by what I mean by that, uh, but they will be as useful as all the global symmetries um, uh, in constraining renormalization. So to get into the story of topological lines, uh, maybe let me first remind you uh, what's the connection between global symmetry and topological operators. So consider the case when I have a continuous global symmetry. Then that typically means that I have another current There are some exotic cases um, where the Noether current does not exist, but let me just uh, talk about the usual cases. Now, given the Noether current, which is <coughs> we can use it to construct the Noether charge. <coughs> which are just some co-dimension one integral in our space. And then the third charge will satisfy all the uh, commutation relation or the original continuous global symmetry. The third charge. This is, is based on classical field theory, right? This yeah. Other. Yeah. Just and classical yet, field theory. Yet you are really taking into account topology, the topology of your, uh, you know. Global I can. Um, yeah. So I can put my classical field theory on some curved manifold if I want. Or any non trivial topology like Riemann surfaces. Yeah. This yeah. definition will work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, why is it, uh, what, what does it mean that Q is a topological uh, operator? It's a, first of all, it has support on some co dimension one uh, surface in your manifold. Right? So, in the ordinary case, you pick a constant time slice. You integrate your current on that constant, uh, constant time slice, you obtain the nerve charge. So it's some co topological co dimension one uh, operator, or more appropriately, let's call it a defect. 
the fact that it's topological uh, uh, follows from the fact that the underlying North current is conserved. So that when we deform <coughs> the time slice a little bit, the uh, charge operator remains the same, as long as there's no uh, charge operator in between. So in the usual case, given a global uh, continuous symmetry, you can use the Noether current to co construct your Noether charge. And the Noether charge should be thought of as the topological co-dimension one defect in your quantum field theory, which implements the symmetry transformation on all local operators. What is the defect? So the reason, uh, uh, the reason that it's probably more appropriate to call it the defect is because when you insert this uh, operator, uh, say transfers to your uh, constant time slice, it actually modifies your Hilbert space. So in that sense, it should not be thought of as an operator in your theory, but more like a defect that modifies your theory. But so far, it's just, a, it's just a matter of slogan. If you prefer, you can call it a topological operator. So, so far, just, yeah. previously, it was just a conserved current, right? Previously, it's just so a conserved just, current. Yeah. yeah, so you might ask, uh, what, why can't I just work with the conserved currents all my life and without worrying too much about the, the topological defect? Yeah, sorry, is that what? No, I just, I just didn't understand. I know, I don't know why they're changing language. Like, why? It used to be that if the current was conserved, then this integral was time independent, then that was just called conserved charge. And yeah. now we're talk, calling it a topological charge. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, yeah. Yeah, well, by conserved, that's. I think the word conserved is only appropriate when you choose the co-dimension one defect. The co-dimension locus to become constant time slice. But more generally, you don't have to. More generally, you can just pick some arbitrary um, co-dimension one surface in your theory. Then the real statement that it comes from a symmetry is the fact that you can deform it a little bit without changing the nature of the operator. So that, that's why I think the word topological is more appropriate than conserved in this context. Yeah. So in the following, I'll probably be even more precise uh, on what this means by topological. But roughly speaking, it just means that when you deform the, the, the surface, you define this defect a little bit without touching any other operator, any correlation function, any physical observable you compute So, um, but you might ask, well, why is it better to think about the topological defect instead of the conserved currents? That's totally true for continuous global symmetry where you do have a current. In the case when you are talking about discrete global symmetry, say a Z2 global symmetry, then you do not have a, a associated current. Another the theorem applies to continuous global symmetry. So for discrete symmetry, the more, most invariant way to say that your theory has this symmetry is the existence of the of a co-dimension one topological defect that implements the Z2 symmetry. So maybe in some sense, uh, the more fundamental object is not the current, but the, the Noether charge, or AKA the co-dimension one topological operator. Why, why should I think of it as co-dimension one? So, so that's related to the uh, whole story of higher point symmetry. But let me first uh, say why did they have to be co-dimension uh, one? So, um, if you were not co-dimension one, then uh, you, you cannot have a non-abelian symmetry. Well, sorry, let, let me back up a little bit. If you were not co-dimension one, then the thing you can act on will not be local operator. So how, how does, uh, let's try to recall, how, how does a, a Noether charge act on the local operator? The way you act on a local operator is that you have some local operator here. You take the commutator between your charge and the, and the local operator. And by, by that, you mean you, you, you first put the surface defect here, and you put another surface defect there, and compute the difference. 
So that means you are encircling the local operator by some codimension one defect. A, a point-like operator in your manifold can be encircled by codimension one defect. If you were to talk about codimension two defect, that will not encircle a local operator. Instead, it will encircle a line operator. So a, code, a higher codimension topological defect uh, will not act on local operator, but they will act on extended objects in your theory. And that's the whole business about higher form solution. But that's not going to be the subject today. I'm going in an orthogonal direction. There's a uh, recent development of higher form symmetry. I'm still going to talk about co-dimension one topological operator, but they are not going to be group-like. They are not going to be associated to any global symmetry. That's the thing I'm, I'm going to get to. So far, it's just uh, I'm just trying to rephrase the, the usual Noether theorem that we learned on the first page of quantum field theory in a more uh, fancy language, just as a preparation for the later discussion. So coming back to the previous, uh, previous comment, that more generally, uh, for discrete or continuous global symmetry, um, uh, it necessarily the existence of a global symmetry then necessarily implies that I have some co-dimension one topological defect, which. Uh, let me just uh, restate it again, that which in the continuous global symmetry case are nothing but the Noether charge. So it should not be something you might be intimidated by. Uh, the, the subject of today's talk is basically uh, to ask or to elaborate on the converse uh, statement that if I have a co-dimension one topological defect, is it true or not that it's necessarily going to be associated to a global symmetry? The answer is no. So there, as I will uh, give uh, various concrete examples, and this has been known uh, maybe before I was even born, that there are various co-dimension one topological defects in the quantum field theory that are not associated to any group-like global symmetry. So thinking about the co-dimensional topological defect not only has the advantage of dealing with discrete global symmetry, it naturally generalizes the notion of symmetry. And that, that's the topic of the, uh, that, that, that's the main point of the talk today, that we are going beyond symmetry and use this co-dimensional topological defect to constrain RG flows, just as we usually do uh, with global symmetry. So if anything, that would be the take home message. That if you have a global symmetry, that necessarily implies a co-dimension one topological defect, but not necessarily the other way around. But if it's not a symmetry, why is it that you can still use it to constrain your RG? Uh, I hope that will become clear at the okay. end of the talk. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The short answer is that it still acts on your local operator. And that action will be constrained. So um, the main point is to study all this non-symmetry co-dimension one topological defect and that they are in the fact that they are as useful, sometimes as we will see even more powerful uh, than the usual global symmetry. Is this in the context of CFTs mostly you're going to talk about? That, that's a very good question. So um, mostly I will re restrict to CFT. But since I mentioned the word RG flows, I, I'm, I, I'm forced to also talk about the massive quantum field theory case. 
Can I talk about the super gravity theories, for example? Uh, that that like this technology. <laughs> so, I think it's generally believed that there is no global symmetries in a true point and gravity theory. But uh, I'm not so sure about the status for this uh, non-symmetry topological defect. Well, in low energy, as low energy limits of string theory, you do have them. Right? Yeah, yeah. So as a low energy uh, gravity person, yes, you can think about them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So those could be symmetries of equations of motion, for example, and not the Lagrangian. Would that work? The example I have in mind or I'm familiar with are not are not really of that type. They will be the Lagrangian. What you have in mind, you mean? What I have in mind are I'm, I'm going to the example I'm going to give are mostly about rational in, uh, uh, on rational CFD in two dimensions. Ah, so no Lagrangian. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I'm going to work in the most uh, uh, CFD language, two D CFD language possible. I'm going to deal with all the primary local operators. Just as a little rope now. Zero point global symmetries have been known for a long time and have been studied to death. But there are a lot of recent excitement about higher point global symmetries, which are associated to higher co-dimension one, higher co-dimension topological defect. But here today, um, we will be focusing on non-symmetry uh, whole dimension one. There may be something at the fourth corner here, but uh, not, I don't know yet. And, and moreover today, I will just restrict to uh, two dimensions, so one plus one space time dimensions. So in one plus one, the co-dimension one means that there are lines. So um, there's a high chance that I will run out of time, so and some of you might fall asleep. So I'll just first announce the results. Hopefully, I will leave some things. So, the first, among other things, there are a few uh, interesting results that we derived. The first one is that if certain and uh, if certain non-symmetry topological lines are preserved. Along RG, then the IR theory can not be trivially kept. The rest of the talk will be mainly devoted to explaining what do I mean by a certain non-symmetry topological line. I will, I will give the condition uh, uh, in details. Can you say a word about trivially gapped uh, yes. as opposed to non-trivially gapped? Uh, yes. So by trivially gapped, I mean the theory in the IR is uh, first is gapped. So it is, uh, in low energy, there are only a finitely many vacua. It's not an interacting CFT. Uh, it, has a fine, uh, it has a mass gap. And by trivially, I mean there's only one vacuum. So trivially gap means that the IR theory is uh, uh, There's a unique vacuum about a, which there's a gap. Yes, you're saying. that's right. That's you call trivially gap. That's what I meant by trivially mm -hmm. gap. And by non-trivially gap, I meant there could be multiple vacuum. Mm -hmm. like, Regenerating energy? They are all back up, so they are of the same length, uh, energy. Okay. The simplest case would be IC model mm -hmm. when you uh, turn on the temperature deformation. You go to one side, uh, if you uh, increase the, if you increase the uh, temperature, 
the IR theory is trivial in gap. There's a unique value. If you decrease the uh, temperature, then the theory will spontaneously break the Z2 global symmetry. And the theory is non trivial in gap. There are two vacua. And what we will be able to show that is that if certain non-symmetry topological line is preserved along certain RG flow, then the theory cannot be trivial in gap. So it's very similar to the case when you have an anomaly for global symmetry, where there are some degrees of freedom for the global symmetry anomaly has to be matched in the IR theory. And since you have to match that degrees of freedom, the IR theory cannot be a trivial theory with a unique ground state. So that's the first result that hopefully I will be able to cover. There's a second result which uh, seems uh, very unlikely that I will be covered, but I will still say it for now. So um, in certain RG flows, using only the information of the topological lines, we can bootstrap. By that, I don't mean numerical bootstrap. I mean analytical uh, solving the equation. So using the topological line uh, data, we can bootstrap the bulk OD for certain IR topological quantum field theory. So that means for those IR topological field theory, knowing the topological lines is uh, uh, well, the topological lines are so uh, the constraints from the topological lines are so strong that they uniquely determine the OPE coefficient in the I, uh, between the bulk operator. Is number one result is also called the uh, topological theory? Um, so uh, I think the quick answer is, is yes. Uh, so it's saying that the IR theory cannot be. Uh, I want to say SPT, but the S in SPT stands for symmetry. So it will be a more, so the statement is that the IR theory cannot be a generalized SPT. And hopefully I will have time to comment on some future direction related to SPT and its generalization. So, so that, that's like the outlook and the main result I, I will talk about today. You, you said the word topological field theory, I noticed. Uh, just because you have a topological charge here doesn't mean necessarily you have a topological field theory, does it? Sorry, yeah. So uh, the reason I say topolo by topological quantum field theory here, I meant in, for some RG flows, the IR theory is a massive quantum field theory with a finitely many number of vacuum. Each vacuum can be thought of as a bulk local operator with zero weight. There's a non-trivial operator product expansion between all these operators, where the OPE here are just numbers. That's the topological quantum field theory I meant. But the topological lines can, of course, exist in non-topological field theory as well. But in the case when the bulk theory itself is topological theory, for example, like those gap theory, the constraints from the topological lines are especially strong. The terminology of bulk theory, again, brings to mind you have holography picture in mind. Is that so? Sorry, that, that's not uh, the, the, the picture. Uh, that, uh, I don't think that's the right an analogy here. But sorry, maybe the bulk is not the right term. By bulk, I only mean operators that do not live on the topological lines, but live in your 1 plus 1 uh, space-time ah, okay. dimension. Okay. Yeah. That, actually, uh, that, that, that terminology, that's also the terminology I'm going to clarify in the main text of the uh, main context of the topic. Yeah. Yeah, I know that term causes a lot of confusion. Yeah. Okay, so so the, the, that's the outline. Okay, now, now I'm going to get to the details. <coughs> okay, so I'll start with some basic properties. Again, many of these basic properties of the topological lines, especially in 2Ds, have been studied uh, by many people uh, in the past few decades. Here, uh, I'm going to give a more physical uh, summary. and um, I'm not going to cover every aspect of the topological lines, but only those that I will need for the rest of the 
So the first basic property of topological lines in two dimensions is that it's topological. And by that, uh, I, I just want to clarify what, I, what, what do we mean by that more precisely. So as a standard CFT uh, person, the kind of question that I'm interested in are correlation functions of uh, local operators uh, in, in my 2D CFT. So I put my 2D CFT on some complicated, say, genus 17 uh, remote surface, and I'll put a lot of local operators on them. And I want to compute this function. But here, since I'm, I'm talking about topological lines today, I'm going to address this uh, uh, correlation function with topological lines. So for example, I can have a topological line circle around here, or it circles two operators. Maybe there's a junction between them, uh, and, and do something even more wild. And I want to compute and study uh, this kind of correlation function decorated with topological lines. Now, what do I mean? Uh, so in the rest of the talk, I will write a lot of equalities. I will write this topological line configuration equals to that topological line configuration. So what do I mean by equality? By equality, I mean I, I look at some local region in this, uh, uh, in this correlation function. And if I do a certain small deformation of that, uh, a region, the answer remains the same. For example, the fact that topological lines are topological means that if I look at this little region and I deform, say, this line to this weird curly uh, line like that, the answer remains the same. That's the, count, uh, th that's the essence of saying that topological lines are topological. That means under smooth deformation of the lines, the answer for the correlation function does not change. But smooth deformation doesn't mean you can cut and glue back another way, does it? No, it does not. So you're not cutting any of those ones? I, I, I did not. Okay, okay, yeah. sorry, so I missed that. Why wouldn't it just be a homotopy? Okay, I guess uh, smooth is not really necessary. You know, so it's going to be homotopy. Yeah. And the fact that it's topological also means that uh, if I have put a stress tensor here, and I bring the line path through it, it does not feel the stress tensor at all. It commutes with the stress tensor. So that's the basic property of the topological line. Only the stress tensor. The other operators? The op other operators generally, no. Okay, yeah. Now, the second basic property of the topological lines is that there is a notion of fusion between them. Um, the easiest way, maybe the most intuitive way, but not necessarily the most rigorous way to say it, is that if I have two very long and parallel, infinitely long parallel uh, topological lines, uh, L1 and L2, I can bring them very close to each other, and it can be written as a sum of another set of lines, Li's, with certain coefficients. In the symmetry case, so yeah, let, let me remind you that all, among all these topological lines, the Noether charges are always special cases of these lines. So whenever you get a little bit confused by something, it's always helpful to go back and think about what's the, what's the case for the symmetry lines. For the symmetry lines, this fusion product is nothing. So for example, if it's a symmetry line for a group G, then this fusion product is nothing the, but the uh, group product. So uh, for every group element, G1 and G2, there's an associated topological line. And the fusion between them simply give me the line associated 
to the group element G1 times G2. This coefficient will be what are non-negative integers in a compact CFT. And the first statement that it uh, like commutes with this best band that is essentially the statement that it is like internal symmetry, right? This can you hear? Yeah, yeah. For symmetries that are more exotic, like time reversal or parity, um, I, I'm not sure a clear way to formulate that as topological defect because then on the two side, you have to do something with the space time. But you told us it doesn't have to be associated to symmetry, right? The topological. It has to be associated. Oh? Yeah. Oh, sorry, it was the nervous charge. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, this picture will not quite make sense. The things you bring, brought it up, it's associated, it defines an action on local operators. So you might ask, why is it not a group-like symmetry? Well, for something to be a group, it has, uh, it has to be invertible. And that's where it goes. The inverse of a topological line might not exist. We'll get to that. You call the symmetry even if it is not a group? By non symmetry, I mean it's not, uh, they do not obey a group like uh, algebra. Okay. Now, there's a third basic notion I'll call the defect Hilbert space. So um, let me first recall what's the ordinary Hilbert space. So if I have a local operator, I'm going to do this here. Okay. Then I can do radial quantization to map this configuration from plant to a cylinder where this local operator exertion uh, becomes preparing a state at one end of the cylinder. And uh, in the talk, I will uh, refer to this local operator sometimes with the, uh, uh, some, sometimes with the additional uh, bulk uh, in front, just to emphasize that it's the operators living in the one plus one space time dimension, but not on the line. So all, this local operator will be referred to as the bulk local operators, or simply local operators. And there's an associated Hilbert space of local operators that we are familiar with um, that I'll just call the bulk Hilbert space. These are just the uh, standard story. Now, with topological lines, there are other Hilbert spaces that you should also take into consideration. They are also part of the specification for the quantum field theory or conformal field theory that you are looking at. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a standard philosophy that uh, in quantum field theory, it's generally not enough just to uh, tell, uh, specify the local operators and the Hilbert space. Given this data, there might be uh, generally different ways that you can enrich your quantum field theory by different extended objects. So whenever we say a quantum field theory, we should be specific about what are the local operators as well as what are the defects <coughs> that we include into the theory. In the current case, we have topological lines. So, um, so I have a topological line, L. And at the end of the topological lines, there could there can live an operator phi of x. It's not appropriate to call this operator a local operator because it's attached to a line. This phi of x operator is not something exotic 
For example, in QED, you would say the electron is such an operator. The electron by itself is not a gauge invariant operator, and the correct way to think about it is that it's attached to a Wilson line. So phi of x are like those operators. So, uh, in this talk, we will refer to phi of x as the defect operators. In contrast to the local operators, or both operators. Now, we can do the standard radial quantization around the insertion of this phi operator and map this configuration to the cylinder. Where now, there's a line intersecting with your constant time slice, and therefore modify your Hilbert space. So originally, in this picture, all the states prepared here belongs to the ordinary Hilbert space, or bulk Hilbert space, to be more precise. Here, because of this uh, insertion of the topological lines L, the state that you prepare here does not belong to the same Hilbert space. And that's why sometimes it's more appropriate to call this co-dimension one object as defect, because it modifies your Hilbert space. And they belong to a different Hilbert space, which will be denoted as HL. And they will be called a defect Hilbert space. How can you compare this picture with this string? Uh, I wonder. With what? This string. One dimensional, you know, extended object, open string, ending on a surface. Isn't it reminiscent of that, that L? Can I think of it like a string? Mm, do, you, do you want to talk about, let's see, D0 brain or D uh, string? D1 brain. So D1 brains are bread, right? So oh, sorry, are, sorry, D0, yeah. D0, you're right, D0, yeah. 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 But D, let's, so, uh, right, yeah, 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 so, indeed, so D0 brands. Yeah, I think they, they, could, they, 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 are, but not, they are not necessarily topological, that's one difference. But as far as this consider, consideration, they don't have to be. So that's one example of extended object. How should I think about Wilson lines and gauge theory and other things? So that, there, I don't have to, I, if I'm just doing pure blue, I don't have to put quads or anything. Yeah. And how do I think of a Wilson line? Is that, because you have now a defect operator, you also have a defect line. Yeah. You have the Hilbert space for the local operator. Yeah. And yeah. the Wilson line is what now? Because there is no, no such X, right? There is no such X. Oh, what do you mean? A gauge theory? So you I just wrote H sub L. But yeah. for a Wilson line, that's not the same picture. You can take L to be the Wilson line if you want. You can, but there's no phi. Uh, there, there generally are. Oh, right. It's just pure blue. Oh, uh, you want to? So in certain cases, maybe the lines might not come with the Hilbert space. So the Hilbert space, the defect Hilbert space would be empty. Uh, that that could totally happen. Yeah. But even in those cases, you can, you are allowed to talk about Wilson loop. And then when, if you have multiple uh, defect operators, mm -hmm. how am I supposed to figure that just, just I can't just go to a single cylinder that way. Oh, I could, I could. Let me just draw it for you. So I can have multiple lines meeting at a junction. This junction, th then there's a whole different world of operators that can meet at the junction. So, this configuration can also be mapped to a cylinder, where now you just have three lines in the second here. And the language I will just call, so uh, in this way I just define the Hilbert space HL, HL1, L2. Actually, I thought more about two different concepts, but I guess it's going to be controlled. Oh, you want, uh, oh, you want, you want something like this? In the, in the original. 
Oh, then, uh, sure, but, but in that case, then that it just means that we, we can choose to radio quantize okay. with respect to this and that. Uh, Uh, there's one important comment I want to make is that since L is topological, it commutes with both the left and the right stress tensors, that means HL, the state in HL are in representations of both the left and the right Virasoro algebra. But typically, they can have non interior space. That's one novelty of this defect Hilbert space. For the bulk Hilbert space, you don't allow that. All the operators have to be this big. Otherwise, you create some funny monography and you circle two operators around. But here, you circle two operators around, you have to be careful about the direction of the lux. And therefore, it's possible to be consistent with a, with a non trivial computation uh, space. of basic poverty before we move actually step two well, maybe just one of, uh, of basic poverty that before we go into explicit examples um, is that topological law generally define an action on fewer spaces The idea is very simple, it's just that if you have a local operator here, I can circle, circle around it by a topological line. It's topological, so I can deform it to a smaller circle. But eventually, I can just do a very, very tiny small loop around that local operator. And that continuous process should give me, again, a local operator. Because this thing does not really have a size, it's topological. In this way, the topological line, so, so by this argument, you should give me another local operator. Let's say O prime of x. So that defines a map, which I'll call L hat, from the bulk Hilbert space into the bulk Hilbert space. And that takes my local operator O of x to O prime of x. Okay. In the symmetry case, that just, that's just how the, that just induces the symmetry action on the wall. But now you, you can have something more general. Suppose I have a local operator here, and I circle it around with a line L. But I can have a different line uh, connecting to this line with a junction B. Now as I shrink this loop, it will not give me a local operator. Instead, it will give me an operator living at the end of this line L prime. So, given this topolog this uh, configuration of topological lines, it defines a different action, which I'll call L hat, with a superscript V, telling me that it's associated to this particular junction between L and L prime. This L hat superscript V is a map from the bulk Hilbert space to the defect Hilbert space. So there are all kinds of maps that you can define using the logical lines configuration. And in particular, we are going to define the vat of the logical line as Eigenvalue, but 
explicit examples. Don't you need to do things like define when you have a line attached to that type of line? Or like a loop with a line that the line defect that circles five but hits that? Yeah, 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 yeah. You can do something even more crazy, right? You can do something like this. And now this segment, and this segment, and this segment, and this segment are a priori all different lines. Okay, so maybe you could just do it by by drawing another version of that thing? Or? Yeah, yeah, I could, I could. But let me stop there. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are indeed more exotic things that... But they're all related by compatibility to these ingredients. Um, there are certain uh, com uh, consistency conditions to, to be satisfied. And I think that part I won't be able to cover today. Yeah, there is a general crossing relations that dictate all this action. Here I'm approaching the problem from a more practical manner, that if I just hand you this topological line, what are the fun things you can do? Okay, so enough for the general formulation. Let me now try to do some explicit examples. So from all this discussion, you might think of this non-symmetric topological lines. There are some super exhaustive thing that maybe as a 2D CFD result, never have to trace in my whole life. But in fact, you don't have to look far for such example. They are really ubiquitous in any 2D rational CFD. Even in the 2D Ising model, there are there is one such non-symmetric topological line. And already in that example, uh, it, it gives a lot of interest on physics. not yet to be confused with the fusion between the topological lines. I haven't introduced the topological lines in the Ising model yet. So the fusion rules is pretty simple. Just a lightning your Ising model. Now, let, let's ask, what are the topological lines in the Ising model? There's an obvious choice. There's a trivial line. The trivial line is having nothing there. Okay, so it's too boring. Let's not talk about it. There's a Z2 line because the IC model comes with a global symmetry Z2. But that should use a uh, topological line. But there's a third guy that I want to talk about. So more generally, um, uh, let me first say that uh, so to characterize the topological lines, there are various ways. But let me start by characterizing these topological lines from their action on the mode superspace. So what are the possibilities? First of all, because um, L, the topological lines, are topological, that means they commute with the two universal generators. In particular, that means this action L has preserved the weight H and H bar. And once you have specified the action of L hat on the Verasoral primaries, the actions of the descendants are also fixed because L hat commutes with L N and L N bar. So that's the picture where you move the line to the stress. That's right. Yeah. So it suffices for me in the IC model 
to tell you how the L hat act on the primaries. So let's say equals to T1 times I energy T2 times F4 T3 times T1. Okay. In fact, as far as L hat is concerned, this is everything uh, you, you, you uh, that's this is all the constraints you can extract from the fact that the lines are topological. Any such action uh, defines a topological action on the operators because they automatically commute its descendants by construction. Why don't you have nine different T's there? Because L hat has to preserve the H and H bar. So I cannot take uh, the identity operator to uh, epsilon, for example, because epsilon and the identity operator have different weights. Uh, L spin was They are all spin zero. Yeah. In the case when there are degeneracies for the primaries, then there is a bigger matrix to consider. Okay. So that's actually all the constraints you can have from topological uh, from the topological property on L hat. Now you may ask, then there just seems to be infinitely many topological lines in the Ising model. I can think whatever T1, T2, T3 are like, that defines a topological action. But that's not the case, because so far we have just considered how the lines act on the local operator when you circle it. But it has to be compatible with modular invariants. So in other words, I can try, I, I can consider the following so let this square be a torus, where these two sides and these two sides are identified respectively. Then I can put a line along this direction, and you will act on the state here. So if I compute this torus partition function, it gives me the trace over my ball Hilbert space, q to the L0 minus four to the bar L0 bar, or while picking, picking up the L hat eigenvalue. But this has to be related to the S dual picture, where I have a line now along the time direction. But in this picture, the interpretation is that I'm computing the trace not over the origi original ball Hilbert space, but over the effect Hilbert space. And now there's nothing inserted along the uh, constant time direction, so I'm just putting an identity here. Okay. So if I pick arbitrary T1, T2, T3 here, no one tells me that, so I take operator T1, T2, T3 here, I can compute this answer. They depend on T1, T2, T3. And then I can do a modular S transform to this part, to this side. But no one told me that after doing the S modular transform, that that function can be expanded on, um, onto the several characters with integral Because as was commented earlier, this effect Hilbert space, the states there have to fall into representation of your sort of uh, representations. So that means the partition functions over the defect Hilbert space have to have a non-negative integer expansion. So that puts a highly non-trivial constraint on T1, T2, T3. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details, but you can show that all the solutions for T1, T2, T3 satisfying the modular invariance conditions can be generated by the three following solutions. By generated, I mean I, if, if L1 and L2 are legit solution, of course I can add them together. That will also give me a legit solution. But I cannot de de divide a legit solution by two. That will generally give me a nonsense solution. So the solutions are, first, there's, there's a trivial one. 
The trivial line is very boring. You just add. It, it just leaves all the state invariant. And this analysis is trivial. It's trivially guaranteed by the modular invariants of the original IC model. There's a second line for the Z2 line. Where the second line it flips the sign of the spin field. So that's an ordinary Z2 symmetry of the IC model. It's a it's a global symmetry line. Now the interesting part is that there is a third line. The way D sigma act on the three primary is such that it's a group two times one group minus root two times half one and zero. So that's the I think that's probably the first, the simplest example of a non-symmetry topological line. It exists in the Isaac model. Um, its action on the bulk operator is not invertible because, in particular, it sends the spin field to zero. So it cannot be associated to any uh, global symmetry. In fact, this sigma is the this e sigma is the duality defect that implements the primary square duality, but. Uh, I don't think I'll have time to go into that. But in any case, this is the simplest example of a non-topological, a non-symmetric topological defect. And uh, one take-home message is that is that is square root two, as opposed to a symmetry line where uh, whose back is always one. So I think I'm out of time. But let me just. Uh, try to prove the first result that I announced at the beginning of the talk with all this preparation. So, so far we have defined a basic property of topological lines. It, it defines an action on your both operators. And I give one example in IC model where such non-symmetry lines exist. And its action on all the bulk operators are given very explicitly by these three numbers. Now you might ask, what is this non-symmetry line good for? I mean, that's supposed to be uh, what I promised at the beginning of the talk. So let me just uh, show one quick result from the non-symmetry line. So if you remember that what the first result was that if certain non-symmetry topological lines is preserved by large flow. Now with all the preparation, I can say explicitly what do I mean by certain. So if a topological line L with non-integer vacuum expectation value is preserved along RG, then the IR theory cannot be trivially kept. That's what I meant by uh, certain non-symmetry topological lines. So how do we prove this? So how well, we prove by contradiction? So let's suppose the IR theory is trivially gapped. That means I have only one state in the bulk. Then I can go ahead to compute the trace 
theory, since I assume by contradiction that it's trivial, yeah? The IR theory, all the states have zero weight, so I don't have to put in those Q to the L0 minus C over 24, etc. C is zero anyway. So I can try to compute this, which represents this torus partition function. But since there's, there's only one state in this Hilbert space, this just gives me the back of that line. That, that's the definition of the back of a topological line. This is the height, this is eigenvalue when hitting on that. And by assumption, it's not a it's not a non-negative integer. But on the other hand, uh, this equal to its S transform. Note that all these partition function nulls in the TQ in the IR gap theory are just numbers because there's no non-trivial weights whatsoever. <coughs> so this equals to this SQL uh, picture where now we are taking the trace over the Deepak Hilbert space with no uh, operating insertion in the trace. But this is just counting the number of states in my Deepak Hilbert space, which has to be a non-negative so that's a contradiction. And therefore, we have proof of the theory. And this, uh, so you know, that's minus five minutes. Let me just say that you, you can check this in various explicit RG flow. The simplest case to check this uh, theorem is that you take the tricritical icing model. So you cannot take the icing because in icing there is no uh, relevant deformation that preserves that e sigma. But if you go to the next uh, minimal model, the tricriticalizing model, then there is some relevant deformation preserving a line uh, whose vector expectation value is root two. And you and and then applying the theorem, you know that in that flow, the IR theory cannot be trivial with gap. And indeed, if you look at the literature, uh, depending on the sign of that relevant deformation, there are two possible outcomes for that relevant deformation. One outcome is that the IR theory has three vectors and it's gap. The other outcome is that it flows to the Ising model. In either case, it's not a trivial gap theory, so it's consistent. And I don't have time for the second result, but the second result is that for one sign of the relevant deformation, we can uh, the, it flows to a, a gap theory using just the knowledge of what topological lines are preserved in that flow, we can bootstrap the whole topological quantum field theory in the IR. That, as far as we know, is a new result for RG flows in two dimensions. People knew that there are three vacuums in that flow, but they didn't know what are the OPE coefficients between different vacuums. Okay, so I think I only covered maybe 10% uh, of the results. There's a more sophisticated underlying mathematical structure between the topological lines. Because today I've only talked about uh, what the how does the topological line act on operator when I put it along this direction that defines its L hat. That's pretty much all I have talked about today. And I also talked about its S uh, transform picture. But more generally, on a complicated Riemann surface, you have to deal with some funny shaped topological line configuration. And the physics there is governed by the mathematical language called the fusion category. And, and that, that's the correct way to describe uh, all these topological lines. And the down to earth way to think about the fusion category is just that it tells you how the lines, uh, set, what are the crossing relations satisfied by this line. So maybe before I, I, I uh, end the talk, let me just say a few outlook uh, along, the, uh, um, uh, along this line. So there are various natural questions to ask. For example, uh, something um, um, people have studied various G symmetry SPT phases in recent years. Those are some trivial gap theory that are protected by certain global symmetry. But now with this new notion of non-symmetry topological lines, you can also ask what are the uh, uh, trivially gap phases that are protected not by symmetry but by non-symmetry topological. And um, 
one big part that's that's missing in this whole story is that you see I was I kept trying to draw an analogy with all this non-symmetry line with uh, an anomalous global symmetry, but in the study of anomaly for ordinary global symmetry, there's a powerful tool um, uh, that uses the background gauge field for all this uh, anomalous global symmetry. And using the background gauge field, you can detect the anomaly, try to gauge them, etc. The analogous notion for non-symmetry topological lines have not been fully developed. We don't know what are the appropriate background field language for them. And um, for me, it's not completely clear that what does it mean by gauge non-symmetry topological lines. Now the third direction is that there are also all these non-symmetry co-dimension one topological defects in higher dimensions. So it's not a story special to two dimensions. The simplest example in higher dimensions is that you take 3D abelian transignment theory. That simple topological quantum field theory already has non-symmetry topological lines. And there should be tons of constraints one can derive just from them. And some of them are actually related to, uh, to various condensed matter uh, experiments. Does it know what the fusion, analog of the fusion category is? No? In fact, uh, oh, okay. The, it will be some higher category theory, yes. In the symmetry case, it is known. In the non-symmetry case, I don't think it's known. The fusion rule is known for some of the non-symmetry topological surface defects of the nature science. But other than that, very little is known. And those are the actual theories you can realize in the lab. Okay, I'm running a lot of time, so I'll just stop here. Thank you. If you like the time, just one question.